your team every day. Welcome to the Locked On Hawks postcast, your home for the best Atlanta Hawks talk. It's local insight you can't get anywhere, but right here at Locked On. I'm your host, Tanitra Batiste. Alongside me is Deshaun Tate. The Locked On Hawks postcast is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Deshaun, the Hawks took a 3-0 play-in record into their fourth playing game in three years. But the Bulls did something they've done 12 times this season. We'll talk about it in the and one. And we'll grade this season and take an early look at the offseason that follows the Hawks' early postseason exit in the 131-116 loss to the Bulls. And Tate, your take was simple. Defeat was imminent, and it wasn't because of the injuries. Exactly. Besides the fact that I'm a little... I'm a little saddened a little bit more than I usually am after a Hawks loss. I don't know what that's saying, but um, I mean, they really picked the worst time to play their worst game, or at least it felt like, I don't know if that just means because it's the end of the season or whatever, but because of the fact that it wasn't even close because of the one thing that me and you've been trying to figure out for the longest is what is the identity. And I think I feel like there's a little bit more of an identity than you do. And for sure, I was like, yeah, Tanitra's right. I'm not even sure that they've had an identity all season long. At least that's kind of been the feel um, of this whole thing, especially after tonight's game. But I was like, if they don't do nothing else, I'm confident they're going to fight. And that's exactly what they didn't do on tonight. It was the total opposite. But a lot of people are going to point towards the injuries, which I think is 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 absurd. Um, I think it's an excuse. Um and during this time of the year, there's so many injuries, not only throughout the course of the season that have gone around to key contributors and starters yeah. and star players right. and everything else. Um, but that can't be the reason for the Atlanta Hawks. I feel like they didn't really right. settle into like to like tonight was an example of what I feel like they've kind of been dealing with the entire season. Like and it showed if you're going to lose a certain kind of way or if you're going to deal with certain things, it can't. It can't show. It can't be written all over your face. You can't have your emotions on your sleeves. Um, and they had their issues that they've been dealing with all season long on their sleeves. But I yeah. think that it was, I think the fact that they couldn't, they never settled in into anything consistent as a team that much this year. Um, and it just, the, the worst version of themselves just happened to stick out like a sore thumb on tonight. And um and 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 that was tough. We got more to say in in, in the next couple of uh in the next couple of segments, but I uh, that that was a tough L. That was tough. Yeah, and for me, picking up on your point, when you look down the box score, particularly with every starter, but DeAndre Hunter, twenty two points for Capella, twenty two for Trey, twenty one for Bogey. 30 for DeJounte, it would make you feel like, oh, wow, the Hawks were in this thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. The Hawks really put in work, especially the starters. But we always say that box score does not always tell the story. No, and when I look at, yeah, and I'll be honest with you, when I looked at the final box score, it was shocking to me. I was like, oh, they scored that many points? I didn't like, know Trey had that many points. Exactly. Exactly. And I didn't know Clint Capella had that many points <laughs> because it did not feel like at any time other than that second quarter that this team had a, a pulse or even tried to figure out, Hey, this isn't working. So let's try this on offense. Hey, this isn't working. So let's try this on defense. And I agree with you at this point in the season with Joel Embiid coming back at less than a hundred percent, at Giannis Antetokounmpo being out for however long he's going to be out. Those are just examples of every team having to deal with injuries. And some of them are their star player. Others may be multiple players, but ultimately, I mean, that's just what it is right now. So you can't just look at the injuries and expect that to be an excuse because you still have to play lights out you still have to play out of your mind you have to play like you don't want to go fishing yeah and nobody seemed to kind of bring that except at DeJounte mm -hmm. except DeJounte and at after a point at a point that starts to wear down that starts to wear him down because he's literally playing out there 
with everything that he has, but he's not getting the same from everyone else. So, yeah, I agree with you. I think it just seemed like defeat was imminent. And my takeaway was quite similar. The end of the first quarter told the tale for the Hawks better than the second quarter. Now, the Hawks definitely did a good job of starting the second quarter. They went on a 14-0 run. They shot five of seven from three. And that was great. That was great. That's why that's the one quarter they actually won, 45 to 30, 33. But here's the thing. The damage that you did that that the Hawks did to themselves at the end of the first quarter really tells the tale of how the Hawks played the rest of the way. Sure. And that's why I don't want to look too much at that second quarter because it almost feels like fool's gold. Yep. Because when you look at the sequence at the end of the game, I mean, at the end of the first quarter, here's what the last 39 seconds looked like. Trey Young, out of bounds, bad pass. Now, the Bulls miss. Dale and Terry misses a driving layup. But Andre Drummond gets an offensive rebound. Then Andre Drummond makes a two-point shot. Then Trey Young has another bad pass. Alex Caruso steals. And what does Dale and Terry do this time? He makes a dunk. Yeah. That, for me, was a 30-plus second sequence that encapsulates what we saw pretty much for the entirety of this game. And this is a team also, if I can just say this, this is a team that the Hawks have played throughout the season fairly close. The Hawks won the final game against the the Bulls in the uh, regular season series, right? And the Bulls took the other two. But those games were always competitive. They were always close. So, and then think about this. Exactly. That, that's what I was going to say. What's the difference? Because think about this. Take Kobe White out of the equation, and we'll talk about him in a minute, but take Kobe White out of the equation, and you look at, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ayo, Ayo Desunmu, mm-hmm. who, lit, who usually torches the Hawks. He only no had doubt. 19 points, right? No doubt. And then you look at the defense. Andre Drummond usually comes in and has like, 12 rebounds in 12 minutes. A field day. Right, right. And we know he was a little banged up too, but he only had four rebounds. The reason I say that is because when you look at the box score, the players that typically torch them didn't do that. Even Arthur Rosen started off hot and had a solid game, but he's torched them a couple times. None of those things happened. Now, Kobe White happened, but none of those things happened. So... They had players injured as well. And Alex Caruso went down in the game. Sure did. So that's why you can't really rest your laurels on injuries being the reason this is how this went down. No, not with what you saw in some of the key moments of this game across this entire, almost the entirety of the squad. I feel like Kobe White is still scoring right now. Um, besides, <laughs> know, right? That fact, besides that fact, like after his post game interview, back on the court, and I was like, I was like, I was like, Tanisha is probably going to be a little slightly indifferent. Obviously, her loyalty to the Hawks and whatnot, but she's also a Tar Heel. Outside yeah. of that fact, however, okay. um, you know, I, I and I'm looking just like you said, like where did all these points come from from these guys, like? I think they were borrowing some points from Kobe White somehow to get some of the points that they have. But I was even interested in some of the matchups that why I did think that it was a relatively bad matchup for Atlanta, just based off of the fact that, you know, you do have two dynamic defensively minded defensive anchor guards between Caruso and DeSumo, where you have Trey, obviously, and and, and DeJounte uh, Murray up against one another. But then the Clint Capella and Bruno, you know, duo against Vucevic and Drummond. And then, as everybody knows, the two guys that ideally perfect world would have been up for most improved player for the league this year, Bogey and and Kobe White. And we see what happened there. But um, a major part of disappointment, I don't point the finger all at one guy. There's a couple guys, but I'm going to start off, obviously, with uh, DeAndre Hunter, in which we've all heard of this playoff Jimmy, playoff Jimmy Butler, yeah. and and yeah. playoff P, Paul George. Well, how about starter DeAndre? I'm going to go that yeah. route uh, because we, you know, it, it's not a secret 
um, of how I feel about DeAndre in the starting lineup versus him as, you know, coming off the bench, what have you. But um, right. it was just, it was, it was, it was, it was discouraging tonight. And um, yeah. I, 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 I want to get to the next segment. <laughs> be yeah. honest with yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, that's the truth. Like, <laughs> there are so many like pieces to this puzzle, so many ways and so many directions that we can point the finger that it's no need to just stop at DeAndre. When we come oh, back, no. we'll talk about Quinn and we'll talk about exactly what went wrong in the end one. This episode of our Locked on Hawks postcast is brought to you by Nissan and Monopoly Go. So think about this. If you're the kind of person that likes to push things a little further, or you ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner, our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. First, the 224 or 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class exclusive Google built-in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. And the 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. And then there's the 2024 Nissan Armada. It'll change what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to eight in first-class luxury and style. Tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada and take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. This episode of our Locked on Hawks postcast is also brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there either as a player or as a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. Unfortunately, that was kind of how it was today. You're feeling low, not sure you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep. Lift your head up and say to yourself, time to get back in the game. Pull off some bank heists and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. Of course, we're talking about Monopoly Go. You can compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. Play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. Charge other players rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there. Put on your game face and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store and in Google Play. All right, Deshaun, time to let you <laughs> let out a few more of your emotions because I know there is a ball of frustration that you are dealing with. And particularly when you look at the first quarter and the third quarter. To me, that's where the game just really fell apart for the Hawks with the Bulls scoring 40 in that first period, 38 in that third period. But what did you see that was similar in how the Hawks defended or or didn't defend in those quarters. Oh, Deshaun, you're on mute. There we go. Much better now. I think that this was a matter of, I, I, well, first of all, what they did not do. It wasn't about how they did defend because I didn't see a lick of defense. My great grandmother, Bessie, could have defended better than they did and she's no longer here with us anymore. That's how I felt about how well or lack thereof that this team defended. I think that Chicago knew they knew how to beat the Hawks. They knew how to play them. They knew how to beat them. It felt very Miami Heat-ish, right, about how we very, always talk about the struggles very. that we have with them, especially when they're playing their best on the defensive side of the ball. Yes. But I, yes. I, I, I not only think that they knew how – but it was it came very easy to them. They didn't have to make adjustments yeah. to try to figure out how to go about doing it. It was convenient. Right. Their style already that they play with was very convenient. They didn't turn yeah. the ball over very much. Yeah. Um, and they just made it really difficult for pretty much just about everybody. I mean, you could say with yeah. the exception of DeJounte, but even DeJounte included. Um mm -hmm. 
some people may argue, did we even, you know, I heard, you know, we was talking, having some conversations about, you know, guys being injured and whatever else. Did we decide to maybe bring Trey back a little bit too early? I know it mm-hmm. sounds crazy because this is one of those games where it's like, he's got to be out there. He's got to play. Yeah. He's got to this. He's got to that. But if you remember how this team looked without Trey Young on the floor, if you remember how this team looked without Trey Young on the floor tonight in the differential plus minus or any other fancy yep. analytic that you want to throw out there, mm-hmm. it, it's, 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 it's legit. Um, yeah. And I, you know, and I don't think sometimes, you know, being, the defender that he is or isn't, I think, yeah. was was also clear. We we gave him, we gave him the credit earlier this year when the when when he was taking the charges and things were looking yeah. better. But it looks like he was just gingerly favoring, and it became mental with what was going yes. on with the finger. Yeah, I think so too because there were times when I saw him revert back to old Trey. Mm-hmm. I saw him waiting for the foul that wasn't called instead of just getting back on defense. Mm -hmm. I saw him swipe at the ball when it was clear, like that's not how you're going to get, that's not how you're going to get either that position possession back or keep the bulls from potentially scoring that ball. So that wasn't, you know, very smart basketball, especially on the defensive end. I saw some times where he was forcing the issue. I know he's probably trying to get his rhythm, Sure. But it felt at times like he was forcing his rhythm. And like you sure. said, that's when you knew it was too much, too much mentally on him trying to take this game into his own hands and be that guy for them that gets them back in the game. And that's where I think, you know, they kind of lost it, too, because it was almost like they forgot how they played. Like, bring mm-hmm. bring that same energy that you played in the 28 games when he wasn't there figure out how to play the same way because this is pretty much the same cast of characters, like Mm -hmm. at least the same cast of characters from the last 10 games. So every, why was everyone looking so disjointed? Why was everyone looking like they didn't know what their assignment was and who they were supposed to guard, who they were supposed to switch off on? I mean, like you said, the bulls seemed like they knew everywhere to be. They seemed like every, it seemed like everything that they did on defense, just, it just, flat out worked. And then it makes you kind of look at not just what the players did or didn't do, but the second unit got the Hogs back into this game essentially because they helped them go on that 14 to 0 run to start that second quarter. Sure. But Quinn Snyder put Trey Young back in. And it makes you ask, was that the right call? Was Quinn trying too hard to maybe get Trey involved and get him going and maybe playing that second unit a little while longer, maybe could have, I'm not saying the Hawks would have won. I'm just saying that maybe that would have helped to make it more competitive. I'll say this first, uh, Tanitra, besides the fact that you and I both know, I've always been a big advocate for Trey, right? Um, And and, and sometimes what's got to be put out there has got to be put out there. Uh, we will go through the comments a little bit later if if you would like. We've got plenty, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. And a I'm lot sure. of it is a lot of it is 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 some trace slander. Yeah. And 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 some of it I, I think is just a, a little a, a little bit much, a little beyond me. But I think some of this is not necessarily just on Quinn about sitting down Trey. I think some of this is on Trey for not mm-hmm. sitting down Trey. Nobody had a closer look to see what this team looked like without Trey Young in the way that it gave itself a chance at winning basketball games, seeing how they played different, not about better, but just different yeah, when he yeah. wasn't on the floor. Nobody had a better opportunity to take notes from the sideline and say, hmm, maybe if I tweak this or maybe if I did this a little di- or maybe mm, and take some pointers from DeJounte the same way that DeJounte has been taking a backseat to Trey. Um, and you can see where some of that frustration was going into the half. But anyway, I say all that to say that when you know, when you know firsthand what that is like, and you've been seeing that in person and you know that this team's chances at winning this game is better with you being on the outside of it. That's where I think that you do have to make that very difficult decision. I know that it's going to be difficult for the coaching staff for the organization or front up whoever, right? Because I know that they were going to ride it out with their guy. And that's yeah. just what it is. And Trey has earned that to a degree. Sure. Um, but in that same breath, 
you got to take yourself outside of that when you know that it's not your night and say, okay, let's give ourselves a chance at um, Friday night being my night. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I mean, that I think, too, sometimes that is difficult for a coach because your star player wants to get in there and he wants to do that thing that he always does, you know, and you and then he shows you like he might hit that three. Right. Or he might protect the ball. He might get others involved and, you know, toss that dime or uh, get the pick and roll going. And you think, okay, okay, it's kind of looking like it should look. So maybe he'll continue that, you know, for a couple more possessions and maybe we can get it down. And, And you did. You got it down to six. But again, you got it down to six because of what you did at the beginning of the second quarter with that other unit out there. A lot of that was that. And maybe somewhere between Trey and Quinn, the decision maybe should have been made to to use him just a little less just to see if they could get back in that third quarter what they had in that second quarter and maybe make this a game because you're only down six going into halftime. Mm -hmm. And then you came back and you absolutely let Kobe White steal your hopes, dreams, and aspirations to That's get to right. Friday night, but you may get them back in the off season if the right decisions are made. So next up, we'll give some grades to how the Hawks ended this 2023, 24 season, but some expectations also in who got next. This episode of our locked on Hawks postcast is also brought to you by eBay motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, Your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. So, Deshaun, you wanted to... Go right in grade season. What grade do you give the Hawks to end 2023-24? Failing. Failing grade, Tanisha. That's where I stand. I don't know all the different letters, whatever the one. I guess that's what F is, right? F, failing does start with F, I think. I think it is a failing grade. I, or if, 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 if you want to be cute with it the way that I used to back in the day when I was in school and I used to get a D and I used to be like, hey, my technically a, a D is technically passing if you really want to. No, 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 not in this household. So, no, not in this household either. When the expectations were expected to be um higher all season long, yeah. we still never really got a good footing on what DeJounte and Trey look like together and how that could work. We got a little obviously, we got a you know, a better idea of what it looks like, but I don't feel like it really got us much closer um, to where we thought we could go when DeJounte first came in. We've talked about Trey getting this Robin or just next, you know, all-star player or whatever, what have you. Now you got him. It has not been what we thought that it was going to be with a player like that. And it just feels like this team is going backwards. If I'm just being honest. It seems like yeah. it's it's the blind leading the blind. Nobody know who's leading the way. People don't want to step on this guy's toes and guys don't want to feel like they're overdoing too much. And this guy has the keys to the city. I don't know who's running the organization. I don't feel confident in the picks in the draft. Nobody wants to come here and play in free agency. The list goes on and on and on. And um, I think this year was a little bit of a reflection of all of those things. I just don't. How about this? Forget about just a failing grade. I call it a failing grade. If you want to be cute with it, let's just call it not a passing grade. Okay. That is fair. That is fair. And some of the things that you noticed about this Hawks team that was consistent throughout the season, just in this game alone, because Kobe White was mic'd up, 
it was so obvious what the Bulls have and what the Hawks don't. Regardless of whether or not these Bulls get tossed in the Friday game, I'm talking about Kobe White, a guy who has had his ups and downs in his four years in the league, but has really learned how to be a starter in this league, has really learned how to be a vocal leader. And again, that is not an indictment of Trey because I totally understand if it's not who you are, it's not who you are. But DeMar DeRozan is that dude. And you would expect that dude to be the more vocal one and to be the one who wanted to be in the forefront. No, he knows his role. He's responsible as a veteran for keeping this young core team together and letting his guard lead. That's where the challenge is. Like you said, we don't really know the guard that leads. Or who's the player, period, who leads for this Hawks team? We don't really know who's the wily veteran that keeps them together. Because I was waiting for that voice. And I never really saw it. And that was concerning. So I, I agree with you that there are some things we need to see. There are some things that we haven't seen all season. And it's tough for me. It's really tough to, to give them a not passing grade. <laughs> but... It's hard to give him a passing grade too. I'll, I'll, I'll say this too, Tanitra, and I know you know I get a little a little long winded, and I don't know how many more of these we got. I know this is the last one, at least for the season so far, right? As far as postcast or what have you. Um, but I have a couple of things I would definitely like to address because okay. while I'm listening to myself, obviously listening to you as well, and what I mentioned, and I pinpointed a couple of players. But I don't think that it helps when, you know, I mentioned DeAndre Hunter and the difference that he looks like from a starter to a guy that's coming off the bench. Um, love the, the the leap that Bogey took this year. The, the, the MVPs of this team this year, without question for me, which is the obvious of Jalen Johnson, with that exception, was the bench that I have been extremely critical about, that didn't have enough talent, that didn't have enough depth. I made plenty, like a plethora of jokes about Bit Krejci, uh, Krejci uh, coming into the season and started out the year that way. He's made me eat some of my words. Bruno has significantly improved in many different ways. Maybe didn't show them tonight, um, but I'm not pointing the finger at him about tonight. Um, even, 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 uh, even Garrison Matthews being able to shoot the way that he had all season long. I mean, so many of these guys that, are, that were coming off the pine, um, coming off the oak that I thought were really good, but it, it was just too much inconsistency with the other guys and DeJounte feeling like a do it all guy sometimes. And, you know, even instances where it was just injuries. And I mean, Trey's defense did improve, but there was just still some things, like you said, that looked like the old Trey that still need to be shaken. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it'll it'll just be interesting to see what's going to happen in the offseason because we don't need to just be, you know, dressing this thing up nicely, putting parsley flakes on the plate and making things look cute and talking about here goes your like No, big, big changes, well, big see, time that's, changes. Right. That's why I said something on our Atlanta sports party that may sound a little controversial, but I said I almost want them like I don't want them to be too good. Because then maybe your front office thinks that the squad you have is okay, but it's not. It's not okay. And yes, you're right that the bench was one of the MVPs, but I also feel like the bench over outperformed themselves. Like I feel like the bench performed, many of them performed way above where you thought they, they could. They so did. listen, we know that there are so many comments to get to. So what we'll do here is just throw out a couple of them. Like Deshaun said, we're going to be uh, respectful to the Hawks, but definitely want to hear your thoughts on this last show of the year. You said, Willie, Quinn didn't make any adjustments and it cost him. I really don't know. And I said the same. And again, Willie, not to say that the Hawks would have won this game because we don't know that, but I do feel like maybe there could have been some adjustments that weren't made 
that maybe could have kept it a little bit more competitive because as the game started to get out of hand, you kind of felt like, okay, when are the Hawks going to take a timeout? Okay, when are the Hawks going to, you know, they just decided to go with an eight-man uh, roster, if you will, for that second half. But when are the Hawks going to do something different? And then Dante Spate said, I'm sad and depressed. We need complete rebuild. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't know for sure if that's the case, but I can't say I don't believe that because there are rebuilds, there are resets. We definitely need to build around Murray. And that's some people's opinion. Some people do think that this team needs to build around DeJounte, but you have a lot of questions. How do you do that? Because Deshaun made a great point. How are you going to get more solid free agents here. What's attractive about Atlanta for free agents? What's attractive about what the Hawks can put on the table with limited assets? So that's going to be one situation. And are you going to take the draft and utilize it to really, really bolster this offense in a certain way? Really, really bolster this team. And Robert Blackman said the Hawks played like they were ready for vacation. You know what? I, I, I got to say, it felt like that. It just did mm -hmm. not feel like the Hawks were in this. It did not feel like a do or die situation, especially Deshaun. If you watch that Heat Sixers game where yeah. both of those teams look desperate as him, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? They both look like, nah, I don't want to go home. I don't want to go home. I don't want to go home. That's what I at least thought we would get out of the Hawks, even though I thought that Chicago might be a tough matchup for them. And Robert sure. Blackman said, from the owner to the coaches, and players, they all get an F. And I can understand the fan base. Their fan base is really frustrated. Fan base is really, really frustrated because they don't know where to look. Because even with Quinn Snyder being a really, really good coach, there were times where we saw situations where we were like, okay. And then Deshaun, you always look back. And last offseason, you look back at the trade deadline. <laughs> And this is where you this is where you come when you don't make any moves when you stand pat, especially because you don't know what's going to happen. You might think that you got enough on the table, and you might think, okay, we can't get that guy that we really want because we don't have the assets. But you have sure. to do something because there's every opportunity that that guy, Jalen Johnson, that guy, Sadiq Bay, that guy, Onyeko Kongu, will go down. Yeah for a minute. And to me, with the rash of injuries they've dealt with over the last couple of seasons, I can't say that I, I can't say that I, I was shocked <laughs> that they didn't do anything in the off season or the trade deadline, but I was very, very disappointed and man, they're going to have some tough decisions to make this off season. Well, guys, it's been a great season despite how it ended been a great joy to work with Deshaun on the Hawks postcast and you guys have brought the heat and we appreciate every single thing you've done every single time we have come through so we think this might be our last show at least postcast wise right so we want to thank you guys for that and we want to tell you that we appreciate you hanging out at the number one place to hang out after every single game remember to like and subscribe to our youtube channel and for more on the hawks especially as we start to talk about the offseason here at locked on check out locked on hawks with our guy brad roland